We are lucky enough to have uh, Professor Rose Zoltek Jick here from Northeastern. Uh, she's a professor of law, and she's also the associate director of the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project at Northeastern. Our thesis is that America thinks of itself as exceptional, but this is the American story and we need to know it. Because once you understand the depth and breadth of violence that there was in the Jim Crow South in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, then you see a through line between slavery to today. But if you don't know the history, you cannot make that argument about the arc of history. If a part of the history is missing, if there isn't an archive, if we don't know those stories, then we can't make that argument. We don't know our own history. We can't be in a transition if there's a hole in the story. If the data isn't there, if the stories aren't there, what we need to do is collect them because they're there. They're there in the family's bones, in their DNA and in their family's histories, in the trauma of those families. They know what happened to their loved ones. But the history books don't tell that story. And if the history books don't tell that story, then there's a disconnect in the social fabric between the experience of families of African Americans in terms of their own family history and the history books which aren't telling their stories. And if the history books don't reflect what truly is the lived experience of the people, then we cannot get to reconciliation because you can only get to reconciliation if there first is truth. Fourteen-year-old young, young Emmett Till, living in Chicago with his single mom, basically wanted to go down south to visit his relatives down in Mississippi. She did not want him to go because she was afraid for him. She gave him her, his father's signet ring, LT. He went down to Mississippi and he went with his cousins to the candy store, to the general store. And it's not clear exactly what happened between him and the white, the, the owner's wife. Not clear whether he touched her hand, whether he made a remark, or whether he wolf whistled. But he, and in fact he stuttered, so it wasn't even clear that it was a wolf whistle, because it might have just been air coming out of his mouth. Four days later at his uncle's house, two men came in the night. The, 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 what, uh, the husband of the woman who was, who, he was the store owner, and his half-brother. They abducted him from his home, they beat him, they shot him, and they threw him in the Tallahatchie River. When his body was discovered, the only way that he could be identified was the signet ring. So we're dealing with the murders of African Americans, but with the way that we want to do it is by a narrative story. Because the story of Emmett Till is compelling because it is the story of a 14-year-old. And because of the way in which he died. And it is something you will remember because it is a story. Numbers are numbers. Statistics are statistics. But you can only build numbers if you have all the stories. You can't build numbers out of nothing. So that what we need are the numbers, but we can't get the numbers unless we have the stories, and that's where we start. Because everybody who died is a person deserving of memory. The idea of criminal law is basically that every person's <coughs> life is matters because society prosecutes on behalf of the victim, the perpetrator. So every prosecution is by definition a statement that somebody matters enough to prosecute on their behalf. 
So that, the, that what we're documenting by saying, by showing the unsuccessful prosecutions, or prosecutions that end up in convictions but the guy doesn't go to jail, I mean each story is a little different, is an attempt to sort of to tell the story so that we can see the differences and the progressions and to understand that there is a reason to have a grudge. There is a reason to have a grudge. Because in fact, the transition from slavery to now has not by any measure been done or been had. That the stories are incomplete and the transition is incomplete. There, there is land loss all over those stories. There's the basis for the ta Coates article all over the three stories that were profiled in our video. There was wealth that was left on the table. And so that the idea of the building for the case for reparations out of the disparity of wealth for the wealth that was left on the table is a different argument for reparations than the one that normally is made. But it's a different perspective, but you gotta know the history to know the land laws, to know the story. To, so that the both sides need, I think, to have their position but ground it in history and let history also modulate their positions. The, the question of incentives to look at history um, is not just financial. It is a question of where you, th what kind of society you want to live in, what relationships amongst society you want to foster, what kind of community you want to have for yourself and for your kids, and what kind of a legacy you want to leave. So th the position that really the archive takes or the, the, the reason we're doing the work is because we think that we'll come out in a better place if we know than if we don't. And that isn't to say that the, n the moment of knowledge and the moment of realization and the sequelae of that aren't tough. They are. They're the toughest work you can do. To come to terms with what's happened in the past and how it affects the present is the deepest work that you do as an individual and the deepest work that you do as a community. There's a, a, a legal um, academician, now deceased, named Derek Bell, yeah. who wrote, who wrote um, many fabulous books, and, um, but also had a convergence theor theory of interest in which he said that basically it will, there will never be reconciliation or any kind of uh, real looking at the history by white folks until it's in their interests to look at it. So that the question, going back to your incentive quest, uh, question, I think is there is a chance that this, that moment is now. And the convergence of the video evidence of the reality of what black folks have been talking about in terms of custodial <coughs> danger. I think feels real to the white community now, like opiates feel real to the white community now, in a way that it didn't before. That's when there's a social moment, a particular historical context, in which there can be the possibility of conversations and change when it didn't seem possible before. I'm hoping we're in that moment. I'm hoping for all of our sakes that we're in that moment. Because that's the moment when there really can be change. Attitudinal change, not just legal change.